Michelle Whitney with me here. Um, we are talking about her company, The Garden, and how she serves diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, could you just introduce yourself for me real quick with your name, your position, and just give me a background of what you do? Sure. Thanks, Krista, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Nichelle Whitney. Well, actually, I should say Nichelle Wash because I recently got married, oh. so I have a name change. So I have to update the masses on that. Um, yeah. So Nichelle Wash, I am so excited to be here. I serve as the CEO and founder of the Garden LLC, which is a diversity inclusion training group. Um, and we really serve anyone who wants to learn. So we work, we're stationed, we're headquartered here in Bloomington. It was birthed on Bloomington soil, but over the years we've grown to become an international um, consulting company. Outside of the hat that I wear with the garden, I get to work and serve students at a high volume serving with Indiana University's Office of Admissions as the Senior Assistant Director for Diversity Recruitment and Outreach. And that is just a fancy way of saying, I make sure that our students know how to access university resources. I support them and their families through the application process and really try to do a, a good handoff. So when we get our students here and we make them feel welcome this entire time that they're being recruited here, my job is that when they get here to put them into the hands of our trusted colleagues and connect them to the resources across campus. So that's what I do formally. That's what I do for work. I am a wife and a mom. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and, and thankful that you all are interviewing The Garden. Yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about what The Garden exactly does and how, like, just go into more description about what your company does? Yes. So, you know, the politically correct term or the formal term, I should say, is a company, right? The Garden is a company because that's the jargon that the state uses, right? Yeah. But really what the garden is, if we really just look at it at its bare bones, it's an approach. It's a heart for, mm -hmm. it's a brand for how I do diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, why did I decide to start it? So years ago, I think it's been about 11, 12 years now, I came to Indiana University for school and I met this man by the name of Eric Love. I'll always give honor and recognize him when I talk about the work that I do because he was my first example of someone who facilitated conversations around DEI with the most interesting groups of people and they would walk away so committed to the work, but it was because of his approach. So just like his name is Love, right? Mm -hmm. He approached the trainings with this idea that you're loved through this process. You're gonna go through a process, it's gonna be hard, but we're gonna love you through it. Mm -hmm. And so I watched him deliver training after training after training. And I was obsessed because my background is actually in STEM. So I'm a science nerd through and through. My heart has been research since yeah. I can imagine. Um, and a lot of times I was one of two or the only Black woman in the positions that I was in, whether it was an internship or whether it was working for um, the IU Simon Cancer Center, didn't matter what it was, if it was part of research groups, I was always one or one of few. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there has to be more people. There has to be more Black women that want to do this, that can do this. There has to be more Indigenous women that want to do this, that can do this. So I started setting my sights on, I need to bring more underserved, underrepresented women into this field. So 2011, I want to say, I'm hanging out in the Neil Marshall Black Culture Center on IU's campus, and Eric Love walks into the administration office. At the time, I was um, a student worker there. And he says, you know, Nichelle, I want you to go with me to the whiteness retreat. And I was like, no, I don't know what a whiteness retreat is, what it possibly could be. I just have a feeling it's not for me. And he every day popped back in there, Nichelle, you want to go to the retreat? Nichelle, you want to go to the retreat? And I'm like, so I finally asked him, I'm like, dude, where's the retreat at? And he's like, it's in Bradford Woods, which if you're familiar with Indiana at all, that's kind of, you know, another way of saying Martinsville, Indiana. Oh, so I had to tell him, I said, uh, I am Black. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I don't know about going to a whiteness retreat in Martinsville, you know? And he just kept saying, come, come, come. It's going to be so great. Long story short, mm -hmm. Eric won that battle, okay? So I ended up at this whiteness retreat, terrified. I remember telling all my little friends on campus, like, if I don't come back, it's because they got me in Martinsville, y'all. Like, I don't know why we're going out to the woods. I had no idea what to expect. We get out there, the staff um, that worked at the manor out there, absolutely phenomenal staff. We have a, I think it was a three-day experience. Oh. Every minute of the experience was so powerful. And the entire time we talked about creating equitable and inclusive environments for people. It was literally about understanding how whiteness or white dominant culture shapes the world that we live in and how not just white people are governed by whiteness, yeah. but anyone who's living in this society, who's told these are the standards of beauty. These are the standards of education. These are the standards of, of health. These are the standards of um, wealth. Like all these things that we've been taught are shaped by white dominant culture, right? So that's where my training started, the whiteness retreat of 2000, I think it was 2011. Mm -hmm. And from there, I was like, this is why there aren't that many women in STEM. This is why there aren't that many black women or indigenous women or, or brown women in general in STEM. So I started there doing this type of work. I would intern in his office. Um, and the, the craziest thing is I think the, so that was the initial defining moment that said, you know what, you're going to go off and do DEI work in everything that you touch. Whether it's in your official job title, doesn't matter. You're gonna do it in everything that you touch. One of the most life-changing moments is I had the chance to participate in a program called Emergent Theater. So again, it was Eric Love, but he had partnered with Gus Welsick mm -hmm. um, and Daryl and Stone. And they had come up with this concept of bringing people together yeah. to put on a production. It was an Emergent Theater production. So you went through 12, I think it was about 12 weeks of training in social justice stuff. I mean, you did oh. some theatrical stuff, yeah. but it was really about having conversations around social justice and all of the students in this production. So there were about a group of 20 to 30 of us. Yeah. All of us created pieces. I did not have a theater background. Okay. I couldn't dance. I couldn't sing. I couldn't act. But the experience over the 12 weeks was so powerful, understanding what social justice meant to us, getting to the root of healing, embodying freedom from the ways that the world had oppressed us. Mm -hmm. So we did this production. It was so powerful. I remember we packed out Wittenberger Auditorium on campus. I mean, it was great. We had three or 400 people in our audience. It was powerful. We, and we would always do it on the weekend of Martin Luther King Day celebration, right? Mm -hmm. So I did that production, I think for four years learning to really embody mm -hmm. um, what it meant to be a DEI advocate, what it meant to break free from so many different things. So I had all these different experiences with DEI facilitation, mm -hmm. with DEI training, yeah. and I ultimately decided this is what my passion is. So while I still love STEM and healthcare, this is what I really care about the most. And so fast forward to some years later after I traveled and um, lived in Spain for a little bit and came back and worked in some different places, I ultimately decided, you know, I'm already doing this work for people for free. So why not charge for the brand? Why not charge for the approach? Because yeah. there is an emotional labor an emotional intensity that comes with delivering this type of training. And so I said, you know what, we'll call it a company, but it really is just the approach. So really quickly, last thing I'll say about the garden, we're built on three principles, education, accountability, grace. Yes. That's what we want all of our um, participants to walk away from, mm -hmm. understanding that it's about education, accountability, and grace. Now, this probably isn't popular across the DEI field, but I approach education from, it's everyone's responsibility to plant the seeds. Mm -hmm. It's not everyone's job to continue helping people learn and develop, Definitely. but it is our job to plant the seeds. We have to tell people our stories. Yes. We have to reshape and redefine histories and narratives that have been whitewashed, right? Or that have been 
um, covered with blankets of heteronormativity or ableism or, you know, we have to rewrite these narratives. We have to tell the truth where, there are li where lies have been told. But as people learn, we have to hold them accountable. So we're not here to save face and say, we're going to help you come up with a diversity statement to plaster on your website. No, no, no. We're going to help you hold yourself accountable. We're going to talk about results-based accountability. We're going to lean in. We're going to really talk about how important it is to no longer do harm to people when we don't have equitable environments yes. or um, inclusive environments. And then the last principle is just grace. All of us are jacked up, if we're honest. Yes. I still have biases that I have to check in on. Mm -hmm. I still have things that I say that I'm like, man, that was insensitive. Yeah. That wasn't the appropriate term. I still have those checks and balances where I need to reach out to colleagues and say, hey, is this an appropriate graphic to use? Yeah. Is this the right language, right? All of us need grace. Mm -hmm. When we give people grace in conversations like this, mm -hmm. then it keeps the door open for humanity. Yeah. It keeps people willing to learn and willing to engage. And that's what I want. I want open hearts. I want open hearts so we can move the needle on this. So that's the garden. Yeah. That's why I would say it's important to Bloomington because we're literally shifting how people think about the world that they live in. And we're having, I'm seeing people go from, well, I didn't know this and I didn't do this to now I want to advocate for this. And that's important. I, I really like how you said that, um, you want people to feel welcome into the diversity inclusive inclusivity space, mm -hmm. because I know a lot of people tend to just like, if you don't want to learn about it and if you don't want to, then you can't be a part. But like the thing is, is if mm -hmm. you don't welcome them and you don't nurture them, they're not going to want to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so and the you, other side, I'm sorry, go ahead. And so when you have, when you welcome people in with grace and you mm -hmm. educate them and you hold them accountable to what you're educating them on, they're mm -hmm. more willing to learn. I, mm -hmm. I find that to be true. Now, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that that's a good point because when we talk about welcoming people in, I never tell people that sessions in the garden are going to be a safe space yeah. because they're not. You're yeah. probably going to get challenged. There will be some feelings that will get hurt. There will be some tough moments. There will be <laughs> moments where you're like, get me out of here. But they're intention those moments are intentionally a part of a bigger curriculum so we welcome you in we open the door of opportunity for you to learn we are not going to make this a safe and digestible space where you're not challenged what we create are brave spaces i want you to ask the question that you need to ask say the messed up thing that you feel like you need to say so we can actually figure out where that's coming from where that's rooted and for people who actually care <laughs> for people who actually do want to be better, those moments are more educational than they are uncomfortable. Now, of course, we get people in our sessions sometimes that are just, you know, they're set in their ways. They're just disruptors. They don't want to change. That's not my ministry. I don't worry about them. Um, but for people who want to learn, if you want to learn, the garden's door is open to you. Yeah, because... Deconst those moments allow people to deconstruct their previous thoughts and mm -hmm. deconstruction is so important to DEI mm -hmm. because if yep. you don't deconstruct your previous thoughts or your previous biases you can't yep. truly become inclusive yep or accessible in that matter yep yep you got it um so since you kind of already answered most of the questions I'm just going to go ahead and ask you what does MLK's legacy mean to you and the work that you do uh, that's such a good question. And, and honestly, when you sent over these questions, I think that was the hardest mm -hmm. question because on any given day and any given moment, his legacy can mean something different. I have a black husband. I have a black son. Um, I've raised another black child. He's my little brother, but I see him as a son as well. And when I think about what MLK did, I think about he opened the world up to allow my black boys to come home. And that's important to me. That means a lot to me that I can see their faces, that I can hug them, that I can do family time with them, that I can send them out to the world and not always be scared if they're coming home or not, right? Yeah. So that's part of it. The other part of it is when we talk about MLK, so often people want to talk about him in this very like 
he was so full of peace and didn't ruffle any feathers. Mm -hmm. And he was just the most gentle soul. And while pieces of him were like that, he also disrupted foolishness and his letters and his speeches and his conversations and the way that he trained people to endure what they needed to endure mm -hmm. to, to, to shift our nation, right? It was not one that was timid. It was powerful. It was forceful. It was direct. And that I always hold that when I do training in the garden, Yeah, that I, it's okay to come strong. It's mm -hmm. okay to be firm in these conversations. It's okay to hold people accountable, but there's a way to do it that mm -hmm. keeps the door open so that you do want to build bridges yes. or cross over uncomfortable waters with people. So that's what his legacy means to me. His legacy is a reminder. Every time my boys walk in, mm -hmm. you know, this door, every time my husband comes home, every time, you know, I get to have conversations with our children about what does it mean to do life different, to be more inclusive, to make yeah. space for different types of people. Mm -hmm. I am thankful that MLK did his work before I had to do mine because it makes it easier. I can say, well, do you remember what MLK said? Do you yeah. remember his messages? Let's <laughs> read his books and his spe speeches. He laid mm -hmm. the foundation. The other thing I guess I should really acknowledge is that I couldn't do this work if people like MLK didn't do their work. Mm -hmm. The fact that a Black woman can sit in front of rooms of CEOs and executives and hold them accountable when talking about race in their company, right? And know that I'm going to walk out of there and then invoice them, right? I'm not walking out of there and being stoned or having a cross burning in my yard or I'm yeah. not, you know, like the fact that this opportunity exists is mm -hmm. because of people and not just MLK, but certainly people like MLK um, yeah. who paved the way. So I'm thankful for that. Exactly. That's all that matters. Like without MLK, no, you would definitely not have a platform. And all of the people that he surrounded himself with in the advocacy mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. you would definitely not have a platform mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they fought for everybody's yep. to be able to get up and say what they needed to say and have yep. an audience to be able to yep. change the world. And that's important. Yeah. Yep. But Anyways, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your insights and I really admire what the garden does. Um, and as always, thank you so much.